There we go. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our 10th uh, and final artist talk for this year um, for the Soup Fine Art Show. Um, this talk is called Abstract Painting in Acrylic, and it's going to be given by Mary Lee Wakefield. Uh, just a couple things as we get going. My first, um, the first thing I would like to do though is introduce myself as the host for today's talk. And my name is Terry Moore and I get to be the executive director for the Soup Fine Art Show. It's a real privilege to be um, in with this bunch of people putting this show on. And as I mentioned before, all the volunteers, we have usually about 300 volunteers that put on the big show, not so many to put on the, uh, the online show, but uh, we miss having all that energy around. And before we get too far as we begin, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the Sauk First Nation on whose land we gather in celebration of the arts and for which we are supremely grateful to be here. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, I will be muting everybody and uh, turning off video just so we can have a good clear feed. We'll go and ask uh, questions, as I mentioned, in the chat box, if you like, and we'll certainly have some time at the end um, for, for questions and answers. And I'll open up the, the cameras and, and um, audio at that point. So my first job tonight then is to introduce Mary Lou Wakefield. So Mary Lou is an ex abstract expressionist painter working primarily in acrylic and ink enhanced by oil pastel and other media. She draws inspiration for her art from wild landscapes, architectural forms, designs and letter forms. She creates work in layers applying color over and under shapes and lines and one, kind, one of a kind marks. Her work unfolds until a story is told. Mary Lou is a member of the Victoria Prince Society and the Victoria Arts Council, and is a board member of the Machosen International Summer School of the Arts, the beloved Missa. So she has exhibited numerous times in Victoria at the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, Chapel Gallery and Victoria Arts Council, and in New York at Southampton Arts Center. Mary Lou lives in Victoria from her tiny garden shed studio from where she is right now, I think. So uh, the talk tonight is going to be abstract paintings in acrylic, and the notes that I have say that uh, that Mary Lou works primarily in acrylic and ink enhanced by oil pastel and collage, like I mentioned, and she will be talking about her process of making art as an extra abstract expressionist, which in its essence, I'm sorry, I'm, it's the end of a long couple of weeks, <laughs> in essence, in a continuum of inspiration, inquiry, investigation, exploration, and creation. In particular, she'll be talking about her experience making art at the time of COVID with restrictions and confinement, what challenged her, what she learned, what surprised and delighted her, and the wisdom that she's been able to bring forward into her art practice. She's going to show examples of some of her investigations and explorations, as well as some finished works, along with a selection of her handmade tools and brushes. So now, Mary Lou, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Terry, and thanks very much for organizing these talks. Um, it's something that uh, a lot of us who uh, do art really appreciate, actually, for the simple reason that a lot of us work in isolation. And except when you exhibit uh, or have the odd person come to your studio to look at your work, um, this kind of opportunity to talk about your work is really welcome. So thank you very much for organizing this. And hello to everybody. Um, thanks for uh, taking some time tonight to tune in. I really appreciate you being there and having an audience to speak to. It's great. So thanks. So this is going to be pretty informal and I'm going to just talk a little bit about, uh, I'll give you a little bit of introduction about uh, me and some of the influences that have gone into um, my art making. Um, I'll, Terry is going to handle the slides and uh, I'll just direct her about which one to put up next. And then I'll show a few things that I've got going on, a few tools that I use that are a little bit different that you might not have seen before. And we'll talk about you know, what, where I'm going from here. So I'll just start by saying that my uh, journey into the art world really uh, got underway in the 70s and 80s. I was, over the last couple of weeks, I've been looking at a few files and trying to figure out like, when did it really all start? And I, I came across an etching that I made in 1978. 
Um, and I was just always that person that in between working and, and um, doing other things, I always tried to find somewhere, some opportunity to make art. It's just a drive. And so this little exploration into um, making etchings was one of the early ones. But really the, the major um, endeavor that I would say started it all was in the 1980s. I was really fortunate to meet a group of people in Victoria uh, in the Fairbank Calligraphy Society. And you're probably thinking, well, what does calligraphy have to do with abstract painting? But stay tuned, I'll get there. Uh, everything that I'm gonna talk about tonight has had an influence in the way I work and what I'm painting about. So calligraphy was uh, about a 30 year endeavor. I never expected it to be that long, but it started here in Victoria with a fellow called uh, Fred Salmon and he was the calligraphy master. I decided that I wanted to take private lessons from him because I really wanted to learn this. So I did that for uh, about three years and I went on to, Terry, do we have the slides up? I can get them up, certainly. Sure. This one. So the calligraphy was, um, yeah, a, a way to start. And um, I think the next slide, Terry, is um, it's gonna show you just um, a photograph I took of all of my business cards. So and just before I get to the calligraphy. So the reason I put this up is this really tells the story of me and my artwork kind of in a snapshot that it's quite varied. It, you're looking here at prints, you're looking at mono prints, you're looking at paintings, you're looking at uh, some tools that I have used uh, that I made myself. Um, so it's quite varied, and uh, I think that really describes, it, it, still to this day, uh, where I'm at with my work. I haven't really narrowed it down. Tonight I'm mostly talking about acrylic painting, but I have a lot of influences that creep into the work. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So in the next slide, you're going to see uh, this calligraphy. This is um, uh, so something I've been doing, as I mentioned, for more than 30 years. I've had a little bit of commercial success with calligraphy, and this is just a, a shot I took of um, my youngest daughter's workplace. They had a, a big uh, event at her store, and they very kindly asked me to do some hand lettering. So this is an example of some modern calligraphy. Uh, the next slide is something that I created in 1992, and just a quick story about this one. Um, for some reason, I was working at Saanich Peninsula Hospital in the hospital foundation office. And for some reason, this one day, I had taken my practice sheets to work, of all things. I must have been wanting to get it done or something. And I thought maybe on a lunch hour, I'll just you know do some practicing. So I had th these pieces of paper on my desk. And a very nice gentleman walked into my office as I was on the telephone. I asked him if he could just wait for um, two minutes till I finished my call and I invited him to sit down. And he was looking at these sheets of paper. When I got off the phone, he said, this is called Sea Fever by John Maysfield. You probably, a lot of you probably know this poem. I must go down to the sea again. And he said, this is my all time favorite poem in the whole world. This poem means a lot to me. So we chatted and I told him that I had been uh, working on this as a gift for my now late husband um, and because it was also his favorite poem and uh, this man happened to be Harry Heine who is a world-renowned marine painter and I said you know I am not an illustrator I can do the calligraphy but oh it would be so nice to have a, a an illustration on on the same piece of paper at which point he said I can do that for you which I was thrilled about, but he said, the deal is that I will make do the watercolor on the piece of paper first, and you're gonna have to do the lettering over top. And I said, oh my goodness, I, I don't know if I can do that. I'm gonna be so nervous. Uh, but anyway, it was sort of a take it or leave it deal. And I took it. And so this is the collaboration. So it's my lettering in the background and the watercolor illustration is by Harry Heine. And it was based on a photograph of my husband. Hmm. Uh, and then the last one, so, you know, th this is over 30 years of work. So this last um, image is, um, the next slide, is called The Storm. It's, a, it's an excerpt from a, a book by um, 
Haruki Murakami. So this would be a more modern interpretation. So all of these works I have been selling since, um, since they've been created on my website. And so that's been interesting for me and I've watched my style change over the years. And I think the main point I wanted to make about it is it's really, it's a calligraphic gestural mark that's really been in me and in everything I've done for the last 30 years. So after, so I'm gonna fast forward all the way up to um, 2018 when I signed up for uh, a mentorship program offered by Archive. Uh, it's an artist run space in Victoria. And I didn't really know what I was signing up for, except I knew that it was going to be a mentorship program. And I didn't really know all the ins and outs of it. But what what it turned out to be was not so much about making art, although we did have to produce pieces of art. Uh, it was all about writing. And I had a career in writing and editing for 30 years. So I was no stranger to writing. But now all of a sudden it had to be about me and my inner thought processes and why am I doing art and what am I interested in? And that was uh, interesting. So we did a deep dive for um, a whole year into figuring out what it is that we wanted to say with our art. And I loved the program. I signed up for the next year where we did a bunch of other things, but that really launched me, that, that mentorship program really launched me into different ways of thinking about making art. And it really made me carve out um, my own way. And I was pretty committed to, to, yes, it's nice to have people say they like this or they like that, but you really have to find what the, um, works for you and then stay true to that. So that program was very um, significant in that way. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I was a writer, but what we were urged to do was to develop and find uh, and create a visual language. And at the beginning of this program, I had no idea what that meant. I didn't know what visual language was. And as it, as it turned out for me, that was part of my exploration in this mentorship program was to find what my unique uh, visual language was. So I decided to embark on and we were encouraged to um, just take a really deep dive into one aspect of our work. And because calligraphy had been such a big influence, I thought that I would continue with that. And so I developed, and the next slide will show you a picture, and I've got a few examples here in real life. I decided that I wanted to work with ink in this program because it was my first medium. I'm very familiar with ink and all of what it does and doesn't do. And so I thought, well, I'm comfortable there, but how can I create a visual language that's just mine? Um, if I used a paintbrush, uh, you know, we've all seen ink with a, with a brush. And, or if I use some other tool, I would get marks that other people may, may have already made. So I decided, and this is where the influence of the landscape comes in for me, because in my deep dive into what really means something to me, I wrote down and, and really discovered, I guess, that something that was very important to me was I was hearkening back to my childhood days of being sort of let loose in the environment. And it wasn't so much being in the environment, but it was the feeling I had when I was there. And that feeling was about freedom and wide open space and exploration. And that was the feeling that I really wanted to try to harness. So, so I'm marrying two things here. I'm trying to get the feeling of exuberance and freedom and happiness and joy and all of that, harness that feeling and try to communicate that in the work by using tools that I had made myself and to use that in companion with ink and to see if I couldn't make some marks that I felt were pretty unique. So on the screen here, you're going to see, you are seeing uh, some of those tools. And then I thought what I would do, Terry, if I hold this up, will they be able to see something or are we will, is just the slides? No, I think it should be, you should be able to okay. see. Yeah, I'll just hold it right in front of my face. So uh, in the screen uh, to your right, there's sort of a funny knobby looking um, tool. And can you see that? Yeah. If I hold, if I hold that up. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that's the actual tool. So it's just a stick that I forged for and a bit of moss. And you can see on the end, it's been dipped in ink. So that that's the, what the handmade tool looks like. And this is also in the slide. I'll try and hold that up so you can see it. So this is it also with ink on the, the end. And it's just a branch that I've attached to a stick and then wrapped with some wool. And that became a brush. And then the last one, just for variety, is just some twigs. Um, again, you can see the ink that's been dipped in. So this became these became my tools for my visual language in this mentorship program. And this, what you're looking at, is part of an exhibit that all of the students um, took part in at the end of the mentorship program. So this was on one side of the exhibit. And then the next slide, I believe, shows, um, right, this shows the kind of marks that I was learning how to make with these tools. And interestingly enough, and it was a, a bit of a surprise to me, but a bit of learning along the way, at the end of this exhibit, I think it was up for a week, um, you know what? lots of people made lovely comments and you know said it was beautiful work and all of that nobody um, was interested in purchasing it which was fine but a surprise to me was i had about three people want to come up and buy the brushes and i thought well that's interesting um you know and then you go down that rabbit hole and my classmates were saying mary lou forget the painting you should just be making these brushes and i thought oh i don't know if that's really where i'm going but thanks for the suggestion so it's just interesting what happens without you even being able to guess so this would be an example of um, some of those uh, gestural uh, works that I did um, again just trying to find a way to express happiness and joy and nature and freedom and all of that in in these marks so my external sources were as Terry mentioned in the intro landscape um, architecture design and letter forms or calligraphy, but I like to refer to it as letter forms. And I came across this quote when I was in this mentorship program and it just, to me, it just said it all. And it's by um, a Japanese sculptor. Uh, he has a museum in New York. And his quote is, we are a landscape of all we have seen. And his name is Isamu Noguchi, very famous uh, Japanese sculptor. I read that quote and I just thought, wow, the landscape is really in me, like all my childhood landscapes and ones that I've seen by traveling and being on a boat and, you know, different places in the world. I seem to be able to recall these landscapes. So when I'm painting, even to this day, I'm painting a landscape. It's not anything in real life, but I'm just sort of recalling things that I've seen. All right. So I'm going to now just um, talk a little bit about acrylic painting. Um, I guess I, I looked up uh, when I took my first course at uh, Visa, which is Vancouver Island School of Art. I think it was 2015 or 16 um, when I just started to take sort of the foundational courses like color theory and abstract painting and painting and drawing and all of that. And I just kind of dabbled at it. Um, you know, I, I have a family. I, I had a career. And so I just did it as I had time to do it. And um, the next slide uh, will show you, I think you'll be able to see the calligraphic influence in this painting. This one's called A Tangle of Wild. And this one I started um, as a student in a class. So the idea of this painting is to try and communicate what it's like to be in a wild landscape with just a little bit of a hint in the background of an urban landscape. And, you know, I, I may more properly have called it like a you know, like a, a wild escape or something. And I think at the time I was feeling that, you know, so often after a day in an office or a cubicle or a hospital or a museum or any places that I've worked, I just could never wait to get out into nature. And so this was kind of a, like a tribute to that. And uh, this is a big painting. I think this is about 48 by 36. So it was big. Um, at the time I painted it, I was renting studio space um, in a church basement in Fairfield in Victoria. And I remember when it got to the, the part where you can see the, the calligraphic, the gestural marks, I remember actually almost dancing from one end of it, because it's four feet long, with my paintbrush loaded with paint and just making these gestural marks. And just I just was having so much fun. 
So um, yeah, that, that was kind of the evidence of it. Even all those years ago, I just still, there's something about making those marks that just really, just so much fun. And then the next one was uh, a few years later. And this one was after I'd been to Mexico a few times, uh, three or four times actually. I'd been there to travel. I'd been there to a writer's festival. And I'd been to um, a few uh, house tours and anyway, other events. And of course, Spanish is always swirling in the air and I love Spanish. I'm not a very good Spanish speaker, but I try. And so when I was painting it, I really wanted to call on all those Mexican colors where they just all come together and they're so vibrant and, and happy. And, and then I wanted to somehow portray this idea of the language swirling in the air. So I had some Spanish uh, phrases that I knew. And I, again, it's with my paintbrush loaded with paint, it's like a thin brush. And I just started that dance again. And uh, there, there's a, an artist you may be familiar with, his name is Jose Parla. And Jose does absolutely magnificent um, calligraphic work on his acrylic painting. And so I was looking at his stuff and he works big and he's really bold with his marks. And so I thought, I'm gonna give it a go. So this is, a, this is the result and it was just fun, really fun. All right, so next we are uh, gonna talk about my other interest is printmaking. And this is an example uh, of a print that I made in mm, maybe 2018, it's called Moon Snail. So it's from, oh, this was 2020. I, I think I made the original plate. This is a solar plate. And in 2019, I had an opportunity to go to MISA. Uh, Machosan International Summer School for the Arts that takes place every year uh, in Machosan, uh, just outside Victoria. And artists and uh, instructors from all over the world come to this two week or three week um, intensive program on the campus of Pearson College. And, you know, for a number of years, I, I secretly thought that I wasn't good enough, uh, good enough artist to be going to a MISA class. But this year I thought, I think I'm going to now, I think I'm going to push myself and I'm going to sign up for a class. I'd never, I, I had done some print, print making, but never solar plate printing. And I looked up the name of the instructor, Dan Weldon. I read a little bit about him and I decided that this was my class. What I didn't know was how uh, significant this was going to be for me in my artistic pursuits. Dan was uh, an amazing and generous and super talented guy. Uh, he pioneered the, the uh, development of the solar plate. Um, it's something that you can do uh, without any chemicals, which is revolutionary in the printmaking world, believe me. Uh, there's lots of toxic and caustic chemicals in printmaking, unfortunately. So he designed this system where the plates were etched by using just the sun. And he taught us this technique and I was uh, absolutely enthralled by this process. And uh, the class was five days and I was that student in the class that was super keen. And so I would drive from my house in Oak Bay to Machosan every morning at like 630 in the morning to get into the studio bright and early and try and, you know, develop a, a, a plate in the sun and then do a couple of test prints. So this was the result of one of those prints. Uh, Dan has an international reputation and he's a big, big name in printmaking. He's well known. He's called a master printer. So Macho, uh, Missa was really lucky to have him. And at the end of the class, he gathered us all. There was about 25 of us in the class, all of whom, by the way, were either experienced printmakers in solar plate printing or they were teachers of students and they were trying to um, improve their printmaking skills and they came specifically because of Dan and so I was I was the only one that was the newbie and I just decided I was going to be a sponge and I I asked everybody you know why are you doing it that way and can you show me what what to do here and I, yeah I was just that annoying student anyway anyway I really loved it and at the end of the class Dan gathered us all around and he said by the way I just want you to know before we wrap up tomorrow that I in collaboration with a couple of other people um, he, he's from New York uh, I am organizing an international print exhibition uh, sometime this year, probably by the end of the year. And I'd like to encourage everybody in the class to submit. 
he said, I'm not on the jury. It's there's four or five jury members. I'm not on the jury, but I am organizing it in the background. I can tell you the dates and what you need to organize and to submit. I think it was 20 US dollars or 25 US dollars per piece. And he said, I would encourage you all to do it. So I, I heard that and I went home and I thought, well, he couldn't possibly be talking to me because I'm the new one. So I talked it over at home and I got lots of encouragement. Like, what have I got to lose? 25 bucks US, no big deal, just submit something. So I worked on a piece that I had started in the class and I had I developed it a little bit more, added some more um, uh, media to it, changed it quite a bit and held my breath and I submitted it. And lo and behold, about, I don't know, three or four weeks later, I got an email and I probably read it five times before I shared it with my family that said, you're, I'm glad to, I'm pleased to tell you that your pre piece has been accepted into the exhibition at the Southampton Arts Centre. And I mean, it was just beyond thrilling. So, you know, I, I was encouraged by my husband and my family to go to the opening, which I ended up doing. I went with a friend, another artist friend. We went to the exhibition and I think the next slide, is, oh, it's kind of a little bit of a diversion. So maybe Terry will flip the next slide up uh, it's just an, an example of another print, sorry, uh, um, in my repertoire. But the one after that, so this is me standing in front of my print that I had submitted. It's the, the one right beside me, the orange one with the blue on it. And I uh, decided to go to a little talk at the end of the exhibition by the jurors because I was kind of interested to know how on earth they chose and of course secretly in my head I was thinking how did they ever choose mine so we had the presentation and all of the jurors stood up and introduced themselves and they said at the end you know if anybody has any questions or you'd like to meet the jury after the presentation by all means come up and say hello so one of the jurors was a woman by the name of Laura Einstein. And Laura was the curator of the mezzanine gallery in, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So I went up to her and I, I shook her hand and I said, thanks very much. I'm just so over the moon thrilled that my piece was um, chosen. And she said, what was your name? And I said, Mary Lou Wakefield. And she said, you're Mary Lou Wakefield? And I said, yes. And she said, oh my goodness, I love your piece. In fact, I love it so much, I bought it. <laughs> so needless to say, I was really, really beyond thrilled at that moment. And I think the reason I bring it up is it's just such a set of circumstances, like what if I hadn't taken the class? What if I hadn't met Dan? What if I hadn't submitted my piece? None of this would have happened. So I think this to me just really showed about the, the um, advantages of taking you know a risk and just doing something that you really feel um, passionate about so it, it was a, a real thrill to have my piece in a, a New York exhibition and I would do it again in a heartbeat if uh, the opportunity came up again all right so from New York I think the next slide shows me with Laura there she is yes absolutely adorable a uh, really lovely woman and I spent the next couple of days with her we went on museum tours and Dan had a reception at his house and you know got to know her a little bit and thanked her about a hundred times for buying my piece. <laughs> uh, so from New York uh, to the garden shed this is a the next slide is a, a one minute video this is where I work um, today uh, before you start that, I'll just say that uh, during the pandemic, I was renting space in a studio with a bunch of other artists and without warning and with no um, uh, reopening date in mind, the pandemic shut us down. So I had nowhere to work. I have a small studio in my house, but certainly nowhere to put up a big canvas and fling paint around. So I looked around and I just thought, you know, the potting shed in the bottom of my garden, uh, it, it's going to be my new studio. So I turfed everything out, I dusted, I painted the floor, I wiped a few windows and I moved in. It's not fancy. Uh, there's no running water in here. And there's, um, I, I do have electricity via a plug in the wall. But the thing is, is what I have. And I've made it work. And it's been just fine. So this is just a quick one minute video. I, I made this for a class, we had to show all of our work in one minute. So sorry, it's a bit fast. But if you start it, Terry. There's no audio, so <clears throat> this is the lovely paint job on the front door. 
uh, still the benches from the potting studio and the compost bins out the back. And yeah, this is just me uh, very much in an experimental um, frame of mind. I think you'll see here is, was really the beginning of when the abstract landscape idea came to me. This is a few years ago. And just really, that's ink. Um, and just really following my intuition, following my interest, using colors that I had never used before, and just really going for it. A lot of these are exercises, so some of them will look a bit funny. Uh, this is my neighbor's backyard there. Um, yeah, just contrasting color. So trying to pull together all of the theory that you know about painting, but trying to develop your own voice again. So this is a little series that I created that I um, have sold most of these, but there's still a few left. Um, just on wooden panel, that was also experimental. I'd never painted on wood. So this was um, about that. And then just to finish up that, um, the instructor for this class really encouraged us to work from a sketchbook. And that also really changed my work. I'd never worked in a sketchbook before, not like this, one that you keep. And it's really a place to just let loose. Uh, there's no rules that nobody's going to see it but you. Um, you can just uh, try anything. And you've got free license to do whatever you want. Mix a couple of colors you've never mixed before. Make some washes, some shapes. Use a bunch of tools that you've never used before and just kind of let loose. So that was really great. And I still, to this day, work in a sketchbook almost every day. So that was wonderful. All right, so moving along. Uh, there I was in this little studio. And an opportunity came my way. And because I was ready to go, I took advantage of it. This is called Postcards from the Pandemic. This was a, a group in Victoria called the Boxcar Six, organized a, a little project during COVID to try and keep artists working and all together. The, the idea behind this is to create a piece of work about five inches by seven inches and uh, as many as you want, and then put them in the mail to the next names on the list. There was about 20 of us to start. And a few days, so I did that. I created my five little paintings, uh, anything you wanted, except nothing really stuck on the outside because it had to go through the mail. I created my work, I mailed them off. And about three days later, I opened my mailbox and there were three or four for me to now do something with. So I took them in the studio and I looked at them and turned them upside down and you could change them, you could paint over them, you could add to them, whatever you wanted, and then mail it to the next person. And then everybody posted their work. This is what it looked like when I got it. And now this is what it looks like when I'm sending it out the door. It was so much fun. I met people um, in uh, Victoria, artists in Victoria I'd never met before. And it was just a fantastic project. At the end of the day, there were 60 artists that took part and we made 900 pieces of art. We had an exhibition at the 5050 Gallery in Victoria. Uh, and then we decided, uh, they decided, I should say, uh, to ha put it into a fundraiser. So we sold uh, many of those postcards, raised $3,000 for women's projects in Victoria. And then the last thing that happened was they submitted it to the Royal BC Museum for consideration as an exhibit down the road, and it was accepted. So this will be exhibited at some point as an example of a pandemic project. That was the, the first one. The next slide is going to show you a picture of a print. And uh, this was an invitation from a print uh, atelier in Paris called Silex. And the challenge was to make prints during the pandemic without a printing press. And I decided that, well, what am I gonna do without a printing press? I'm just gonna look around me and see what's right in front of me. So this is a print I made from the iron cover of my water main in my front yard. Uh, the next slide is, I just remind myself, whoops, back up one. I'm trying to back up one. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Oh, a couple maybe. There Sorry. we go. That's it. Uh, this was using a piece of muslin with printing ink and then trying to create an interesting shape. Uh, so that's the second one. And then there, were a th there was a third one. And again, I mailed off my three prints. I had no idea what was going to happen. Then about six weeks later, I got three of the most beautiful prints back from Paris, from this little atelier, from three different artists there. And yeah, it was just nice to have a connection with with the uh, with the print studio and point is it, it kept us all going and, and making work. So that was great. And 
All right, so I'm now going to just talk about, maybe I'm going to stop there for a minute because it's already 40 minutes into this. I'm going to stop there for a moment, if it's okay, Terry, and just, sure. I've been blobbing for a while. Uh, ask if anybody has any questions at this point. Um, don't be shy. Would you like me yeah. to put up back into um, the view uh, for everybody, or do you want them to type it into the question or the chat? I think, I think you can open their mics. I think that's going to be easier for them. Um, if they want to type it into the chat, that's fine too. But if anybody has any questions at this point, I'm happy to answer anything. Mm. I'm going to have a drink of water. Sure. Um, feel free. Actually, you should, you should be able to um, open your own mics, I believe. Uh, in here. So, let's see. If there's no questions, I'll keep going. Well, I, have, I just thought I would. Um, oh, I see. Uh, one. This is uh, Jean. I have a question about the the Macefield poem and how, especially knowing that you couldn't, um, oh, you couldn't make a mistake on it. How did you figure out how to end or and place the lines? Well, rem remember I said I had those practice sheets um, yeah. at the hospital on the table. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of it. And okay. just doing it over and over and over again. And then I did it on tissue paper so I could see um, uh, what I had done on a nice piece of paper underneath. I had rewritten mm -hmm. it on tissue paper and put it over the um, nice paper and then started to move it back and forth to see where it might the lines mm. might line up or Wow. I wanted it to be like a jagged line, not just a block of text, because that's just yeah. too formal and that's not me. And it was also about the ocean. So I wanted it just sort of a little bit of flow to it. You know, I was thinking about all these things. But I said to, to Harry, my hand is going to be shaking because I know I'm <laughs> going to mess it up. You know? <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of pressure. Uh, but I just decided to just do it. And, and it's nice that it's not on the screen right now, because if you look really closely, there's a, there's a few mistakes, but I probably only, I know where they are. Yeah. Just a few little things, but that's okay. I was just so thrilled that he agreed to have the, the that cre agreed to do the painting. Yeah, I have a, a, a copy, a print of that. And I've always admired it. Now I'm going to Ooh. admire it even more because... <laughs> Oh, okay, don't look no, at I'll it with a magnifying it. glass. No, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Give it a question. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, maybe we'll keep going if there's no questions, no more questions okay. at this point. All right. So just a little bit about my um, um, acrylic painting process. When I start with a blank canvas, one of the first things I do is I like to uh, kind of wake up the canvas. And I learned this through trial and error and being in classes with very experienced, experienced painters. And no surprise, what I often do on the canvas to just, you know, staring at the white, it's like staring at a blank screen when you're trying to write something. It's the same sort of terrifying feeling. You've got this big white canvas and like, how am I gonna get into this? So I often start by writing something. Hmm. And I might use charcoal, I might use a pencil or a pen, or if I want it to show, I might make it in, into a permanent mark. If, um, uh, if I don't want it to show, then I might do it in just light pencil or something that's a light color. Everything in my work uh, is done in layers. So I apply lots of layers. Um, so sometimes those layers could be shapes, colors, lines, marks. And the idea is to build up this history and the layers are significant for me, you know, because it's like, um, you know, we all have a history. We all have a story to tell. And I'm hoping that the story of the painting, uh, you know, I'm trying to mimic that or mirror that, that this painting has a bit of a history. It's me engaging with it. I paint, I stand back, I look, I respond to what I see. I might add a new color or take away something. I might cover that mark up or I might make three more of them. And it's just that it's almost like call and response. I just keep working until something starts to emerge and then I develop that. Um, that's kind of the, the, um, the quick answer to how I work. And then, you know, I, the standing back and just looking at it is really important. Sometimes I take it out of the studio and I actually hang it in my house, in the living room or the dining room with really good light. And then I, over the next series of days or weeks, sometimes months, um, I just keep looking at it. And I, if something bugs me, 
I have to change it. Or I think, ah, I know what this, I know what this needs now. It needs a that and I'll, you know, enhance it or, or, or do it that way. Um, so again, it's, but it's the feeling. So I don't look at a landscape and think, okay, there it is. I'm going to paint that. I look at it. I photograph, I take lots of photos. I might sit and sketch something about that. It might not be exactly what I'm looking at, but it'll be something to remind me of what I'm feeling when I'm looking at it. Mm. So the, the slide that you're gonna see next is um, the painting that I'm so thrilled to say was the one that was accepted into the Souk uh, art show. So this painting has uh, lots of layers. This is a, a fairly large painting. I'm, I think it's 40 by 30. That's, I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's a, around that, it's quite large. Um, and it's painted on a wooden cradle panel. And mm. this painting is significant for me because it's the first one in a series that I am calling uh, Finding the Light. And I realized that in a lot of my work, there always seems to be a bright spot in the paint that doesn't matter what colors I'm using, there always seems to be one little bright something. And this painting, uh, this was one of the first ones that I painted after the pandemic. And um, yeah, this also uh, coincided uh, sadly with um, some time in my life where things were looking pretty dark. I lost my husband last year in uh, October, it's very suddenly and stayed out of the studio for many months. And this was really the first painting that I made following all of that. Added to that, the, the layer of darkness that we all had during COVID and isolation and separation, it was, it was a tough winter for me. And I think the idea of finding the light just really resonated on a deeper level for me. So what you're looking at is a kind of a bright sky um, an earth, an earthy sort of a, a landscape with some marks that again were covered up and then exposed, more added. I actually took my sander to this one and sanded uh, to get down and expose a couple of layers and then I painted over it. This one also is a, a lot of ink on this and I, when I say ink I mean acrylic ink but I was not going to lose that bright spot on the horizon. I just wasn't because that you know metaphorically for me is very significant and what you can't see in the slide um uh but you can see in real life um i can't point to it but in the i'm going to say the lower just off center um there's a little it looks to me on the slide it looks like a little triangle just over a little bit more to the right a little bit more can you see my cursor no, you can't. No, okay, come down, yeah. come down on your cursor. Down, 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 down. Stop. Now go to the Ooh. right. Yes. Over to the right. Right there. Right that there. little triangle. Well, well, I didn't draw a triangle and I didn't intend to draw a triangle. It's just a mark. It's just me making my marks with various things. But when I saw it, to me, it was a sailboat. And um, that in my life is particularly uh, significant because my husband's um, yeah his death was um, uh, involved a sailboat and so when I saw that I just thought wow this is just a pretty incredibly powerful painting for me and it, it the emotion in it for me is yeah incredible not everybody would see that but um, yeah the finding mm -hmm. the light series really just evolved from all of that okay so that's a little bit about the process I want to just read this quick quote that I came across recently by Daniel Siddell, and he's an art critic and an art curator and an art instructor. And he said about artists, artists don't paint to express something they already know or feel, but to discover something about the world or themselves that they don't already know and can't know by any other means than by painting. So when I read that and I looked at this painting, I thought, what is it I'm supposed to know? And that's where the idea of finding the light came from, is that's what I'm supposed to know, mm. is that there's light. Mm. Okay, moving on. <clears throat> the next, uh, this is just a, a picture that some of you who live in Victoria might be familiar with. It's a place I ride my bike by very often, and it's a field in central Saanich of some beautiful vegetable fields, and it's just right out at um, Mitchell Farms. 
And the next slide will show you how I abstracted. That's my painting of that of something to do with that field. And for me, it was just about the shapes and the boxiness and the lines and the, the way it goes off into the distance with the blue sky and some of the green in the fields. That's, that's how I interpreted it. And that was a painting that was on my website for, um, I guess, a couple of years and then just sold um, about a year ago. So that's just an example of how it goes from you see a photo or you see something, you take a photo, you might do a couple of sketches, and then you take a stab at painting it. That, that's it from beginning to end. Okay, uh, the next slide is uh, me sitting in the middle of Bowker Creek on a rock <laughs> sketching. So this is part of my process too. I will go into, uh, like in, go into nature and just sketch something about it. I'm really fascinated by certain aspects of this, which I think the next slide will show you um, and I've got this in real life, I think, if it's the slide, I think. So this is a reflection of the trees in the water. So those, no surprise, you can see the sort of calligraphic lines. Uh, that's what really caught my eye that day. And I tried to recreate that in a painting recently, and it's, um, it's not there yet, but it's been really fun to try that. And then uh, the next slide, I think, shows, okay, there it is. So you can see on the right hand side there, there's a little um, well of ink. And what I've got there are some willow branches that were growing along the side of the creek. So I picked the willow branches, I bound them together, I dipped them in the ink, and I tried to mimic those lines in the water on a piece of paper. And then I just <laughs> stuck it on my Bowker Creek sketchbook um, to remind me that's, that's what I was going for. Okay. Coming to the end, we're just about, um, I've got a few more slides to show. Um, can you do the next slide for me, Terry? Right, okay. This is a, um, another example of me um, being inspired by something in nature. This was a trip I took out to Point No Point, uh, many trips, but this was one. And what really um, stayed with me was the uh, power of the rocks out there. And I, I just started to think about how the landscape stays where it is over centuries, millennium. We come and go, civilizations come, we go. Visitors to point no point come and then we leave, but the, the landscape stays. And they really are, um, I, in my little creative moment, I thought they're real, they're sentinels. They're like, they watch over everything that's going on. And I just wanted to try and paint that idea, as crazy as that sounds. So this was a painting and this was in the uh, art gallery of Greater Victoria recently and that show and it, it sold a couple of weeks ago. So that was that one. And I wanna show you the next slide is how it started. That's the finished piece. This is how it started. So I just start Ooh. with some colors, uh, some shapes. I start to get an idea and then I just go with it. So, you know, from one to the other. Um, okay, that's that one. And the next slide, Terry, is this is an, another little landscape that I did <clears throat> that's also currently in the art gallery show. This was an experiment. Um, I think I mentioned that I like to experiment with tools and colors and everything. This is one that I decided to paint on mulberry paper. Anyone who knows mulberry paper will know it's absolutely beautiful textured paper. So I painted on the paper and then I attached the paper after it was finished, I attached the paper to a wooden cradle, um, about 12 inches by 12 inches, and then framed that. So when Terry mentioned that I like multimedia, this is ink and paint, and then some of the shapes, the little roundish and oval shapes are all done with oil pastel. Hmm. That's an example of that. Okay, next is... Oh, that's just a little close up. There's the oil pastel. And after two years of struggling with fixing oil pastel on a painting, I'm happy to say I finally found the right fixative. So no more bleeding of the oil pastel, which is great. Okay, next is... So here we are. Uh, these are uh, the next two actually are some, some things that I've done quite recently, uh, working with completely different colors. And I'm pretty sure summer and summer fruit and summer berries and summer sweet peas and all of the beautiful fruit that's around influence the colors in this piece. 
and also I think the heat had something to do with it. And these are this one and the next one. If you want to go to the next one, you'll also see that I am trying to find a way um, to uh, incorporate this calligraphic gestural. And this is this is something I've been working on for the last um, I'm going to say a couple of months. It's really difficult to combine um, ink and paint. Um, you know, you can have your paint, your pen loaded with ink, but it's very hard to go over top of acrylic paint. If you go under it, you just end up covering it up. So the process I ended up um, that's working for me right now is to, it's very long and laborious, but the process is to make some calligraphic uh, pages with my pen and ink on a piece of paper, a special paper. Then I photocopy that onto uh, kind of a tissue paper, but a little bit heavier than tissue paper, and then apply that tissue paper to the um, the painted piece and with a acrylic medium, and then just um, glue it down and then spread it with a spreader, and then in places um, touch the paint over it. So it's quite long and laborious, but it works, and the ink doesn't bleed, which was the goal. So that that worked out really well. Wonderful. I have a question here from Denise. She's asking, what do you use to fix oil pastel? Oh, well, Denise, I will tell you, this will be worth the price of admission. This is, uh, so the, can you see this if I hold this up? I'll, I'll say it anyway, and I'll show you at the end. Uh, this is a fixative by Sennelier, which is the manufacturer of the oil pastels. Um, and it's just called, uh, yeah, fixative. And I think it requires about two or three light uh, sprays of this and you're good to go. So that's been just an amazing find. Um, Opus hasn't had it for the last year or two years because of the pandemic, you know, the supply chain. Um, and so when I read an article about it, I put in an order. So I now am the proud owner of two whole cans of this that I'm gonna use. And the last slide is my little funny garden shed studio and a 48 by 36 blank canvas uh, that I just uh, was asked to do as a commission. And so I'm really excited about that. I've done commissions in the past, but much smaller, like half that. So this is the largest I've ever done. And the way it worked is that this couple saw a few things on my website that they really liked, uh, but they were small. And they said, could you do a painting that's 48 by 36? And me being, you know, me and um, not knowing when to say no, I said, yes, I can do that. So now I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And so far, it's going really well. I've got I've got three or four hours worth of work on it at the moment, which I'll show you at the end. I'll just turn my camera around. So that, phew, that is my presentation. Uh, thank you all so much for your kind attention. I'm really happy to answer any questions if there are any. And I'll now I'll turn it back to Terry. Uh, thank you, Mary Lou. That was uh, that was really fascinating. I I'm I am not an artist of, of, of anything other than just dabbling around in a few little things. So it's it is particularly interesting to me about the process how do, how do you get to where you where you are now what have you learned how what were the steps along the way and it just it sounds like a really interesting story that you've had so I, thank you for sharing that with us i'm happy to open it to questions um from anybody um let me see if i can get back to the i'll go to gallery view and please feel free to um, open up your microphones and turn on your video now. We'd love to see you and, and find out if you have any questions. But Yes, let's see you all. It's just been me staring at myself all this time. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah. That's wonderful. I love um, yeah. the expression yeah. telegraphic. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I loved your expression telegraphic gestural mark. No, calligraphic. Eh? Calligraphic. Oh, calligraphic. Yes. Ah. I like, okay. the, I like the telegraphic. But telegraphic yeah, would be, okay, that makes more sense then, but I thought, ooh, that's, that's pretty cool. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, it does. Um, it's amazing what you learn early in life, how it actually, this is what I learned is, you know, it's true of me with music too. It, it actually stays in there. You just got to find a way to tap into it. I believe it's in there. Same holds true for writing, I'm thinking. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Did I see that Leslie um, had something to say? Oh, we we're just trying to get our video going and it says the host oh. has disabled it, but that's okay. Oh, we don't, wow. have to, Please, we don't need me. to be on there. 
Well, I'll, I'll okay. start. Yeah, there we go. Oh, there we go. Okay, there, there we are. There Hi. we are. <laughs> um, I just had a comment and, and it'll probably turn into a question, but I just wanted to say that um, I was really struck by both the depth and the diversity of your work, Marilu. I have seen your work over the years, but I haven't seen it to that um, that much variety and that that much span of, of your career and it is so wonderful to watch and to see this um, presentation. So um, I'm curious about you mentioned already that your process. Say more. Say more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> your, you mentioned um, that you start often your paintings with words. I think that's what you said, right? Mm -hmm. which doesn't surprise me because you're such a wordsmith and a storyteller and I totally see that in your in your work um where do you think I mean you said you draw on nature and that you use words where do, where do you think you go like I, I'm just curious I know it's such a personal thing but um for somebody who's maybe just starting out or for somebody who doesn't have a really concrete process what, what, what could you what kind of advice could you give to somebody who um is trying to find that way to um try to find a way to what's the word i'm looking for almost um express express or um, channel that's the word i was kind of looking for channel like sort of the way you are doing so well with i think uh thanks lisa for the question mm -hmm. i think uh it is intensely personal mm -hmm. and so sometimes um I will just try and listen to what's going on in there and try and shut the chatter up and mm. just see what comes up. So mm. when I was, you know, I've, I think I've done maybe half a dozen of these finding the light um, in a series paintings. Often I would just write the word light and it mm. just gets that thought in my head or I would mm. write the word um, like a whole sentence and it could just be gibberish it could just be um, uh, keep working towards the light let's say it was that and it would just be with a pencil right on the canvas and I, I knew those words were going to be covered up but only I knew like this part of the history of the painting but I know it's there mm. nobody else oh. can see it but it's it's almost like that's what's going to speak back to me what what's going to guide me here mm. and say something about that Cool. Yeah. Very cool. It sounds almost like a form of meditation in a way, too. Mm -hmm. it's like a form of yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think it's getting so clear. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And I think it's also about a focus. Mm -hmm. yes. 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 About Forty eight mm -hmm. inches by thirty six inches. <laughs> kind of a big space to get lost in, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that like focus somehow. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Great question. <laughs> okay. And I'd like to know how we um, can connect to this talk again. I mean, to, to review it. To review it again, it will be mm -hmm. put up on our website again. If you go to soupfinearts.com, um, mm -hmm. right now it's under the show, but we're going to make sure that, that we've mirrored the page. And if you look for uh, artist demos and talks, it'll be there. They'll, they'll be all listed in... Um, in order of when they were they were made so so you can right. see the rest of the talks that are there you can review mm -hmm. this one again and there are also some demonstration videos that are on there as well super thank you yeah. and i think you said terry it's going to be up for a year i right, we're going to leave it up until the next show or shortly before the next show okay, um, so it will be up for the rest of the, yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot to a lot to take in there's a lot to learn and you always it's nice to be able to go back to something because you know you're going to pick up something else from it as well so right. that, that yeah. works really well that way so that's great any other questions from people thanks for the questions it's really nice to good, uh, good questions i think yeah. i have a comment for you mary lou oh great okay i think i'm inspired to try more abstraction in my work i've okay. mostly well, I'm a photographer as well, so I do a lot of realism, but uh, I kind of like to try that. I love the idea of putting a word on the canvas and then having it come through. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very good. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm new at abstraction. I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know if I, you know, I, I call myself an abstract expressionist. I mean, it's just a word. It's just an expression. But 
I think for, it's learning what abstracting is and yes. what I've what I've come to understand over the last couple of years is that really what the essence of abstraction is 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 really reducing something down to its bare essential. Yeah, so maybe so. that green field was just a few blocks of green paint that represent something much more detailed and much bigger and more organized. Mm -hmm. But um, it's really that the abstract artist really just tries to get to the essence of something. And I love that. What, what else I love about it, which really suits my personality, I think, and why I'm attracted to it is I love the idea that I can paint that. Let's just take the example of the field. Mm -hmm. I can paint that and I see something, but you're going to look at it and it might remind you of a scene that you're familiar with that has nothing to do with central Saanich or, you know, um, produce fields. You're going to see your own interpretation and you're going to bring mm -hmm. that to your experience of looking at it. And that's the element that I think is just so intangibly wonderful about abstract yeah. um, artists. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't yeah. possibly paint a realistic painting of the scene I'm looking at out my studio window right now. I can't do it. But I can, I can give you an idea of what the essence of it is for me and then mm -hmm. leave it up to you to take from it whatever you want. And I love that, that part of it. Mm -hmm. That's a great yeah. description of what abstract art is or, or or could be or is or should be but uh, mm -hmm. very often is uh, that's wonderful thank you for that mm -hmm. can i just very quickly just um turn my camera sure um, so the last slide there showed showed you this 48 by 36 blank canvas and i just want to show you what's been happening since then and hopefully you'll be able to see at least part of it, it takes up the whole studio by the way oh, so wow. oh there wow. it is so far and again, these are, I'm going to get my head out of there. Oh. Colors. <laughs> Can you still see it? Yes. Mm, I, yes, I, absolutely. On my, hang on a second. I can't. Uh, there we go. Um, there. So again, it's layers and some of that might get covered up again or changed or, you know, it's changed all, a bunch of times already. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so that's, that's it so far. <laughs> It's just, and I've, because the client is somebody I know, I'm taking pictures of it every day. At the end of the day, I take another picture so she can see the evolution of it. And then I'll just let her, she's also a photographer, like Leslie, and uh, I'll just be able to give her like half a dozen photos or however many, however long it takes me. Thankfully, she hasn't given me a strict deadline, just whenever you, whenever you can get it done. Oh, that's nice. Right. Great. Thank oh, you for that sharing is. that. That's, that's really wonderful. So I, it, it's, it seems to me that we're coming to sort of a natural conclusion here. So I will say thank you so much, Mary Lou, for, um, for sharing your journey so far and what you're, what you're doing and your techniques and, and your thoughts and, uh, and your life so far. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate it. Thank you to everyone else yes, thank for you. listening in. And, thanks uh, for tuning in. I really yeah. appreciate having an audience. Thanks, you guys. <laughs> thanks so much. And I'm wonderful that you're that you're asking questions. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, I really appreciate it. As I mentioned, uh, we will be putting these up online. It probably won't get up there until tomorrow when my my trusty sidekick Jen is back in the office and able to put that uh, up on the on the website for us. But and, and tomorrow, sadly, is the last day of the show. I would encourage you, if you have not had a chance to go take a look at it. It's amazing, amazing pieces of art online. And then we do also have, um, and that's at soupfineartscom We do also have the award winners or most of the award winners at uh, the Souk Arts Council Gallery in Souk. And that'll be going for another week. That'll be on till August the 8th, every day from 11 to 4. And it's just open. Please come and take a look at some of the wonderful pieces that are there. It's such a treat to be able to see something, um, something in real life. So it's a, it's a real treat to see that there. And we thank for them, thank the Arts Council for letting us uh, to share that space for this time. So. Um, and again, uh, thank you all very much for being here. I hope you do enjoy a little bit more of the uh, show if you're able to and uh, and touch wood everywhere. Let's hope uh, for next year we have a lot of shows. So, and we'll, yeah. Uh, yeah, get going on that, but. Um, all right. Thank you, Terry, for doing a really good job of the slides and oh. thank you all you guys for um, showing up tonight. I really appreciate it. That's wonderful. Thank you. Great.
Bye -bye. some of you soon. Okay, bye. Bye bye. Bye, Claire. <laughs>